This is Math 251, section 11.7. In this section, we're going to be looking at projectile motion problems, specifically as an application of our vector-valued functions that we've been working with. You actually worked with some types of projectile motion problems in Calculus 1, but specifically, you were only able to do projectile motion or motion in one dimension. So in Calc 1, the object that you were throwing had to go straight up and straight down, right? You could only go straight up and then come straight back down. In this section, what we're going to find is we can deal with additional complexity. Now that we've got vector-valued functions, we'll be able to deal with not only the up and down direction, but also a horizontal component and potentially even a side-to-side -side component if we go to three dimensions, which we will. So we'll definitely be able to get more information by using vector-valued functions. I'd like to start by just reviewing what we already know about the straight up and down or one-dimensional motion, because a lot of that is going to come back and we'll be able to use some of the same types of reasoning with our vector-valued functions. So here we have a person standing on a high cliff. They're holding a rock just over the edge of that cliff, and they throw it straight up. The height of the rock after t seconds is given by this height function, s of t. I'm going to start by asking for height, velocity, speed, and acceleration after 2 seconds. So height, of course that's nothing more than plugging the 2 in for s, into s rather, plugging it in for t. And that's just something you can stick in your calculator. And I'm getting 192. And let's see here. Um, they did not give me units, but actually looking at the gravitational acceleration has to be feet. All right, velocity. I suspect that one of the things that you studied in Calc 1 is the fact that the derivative of your position or height function is your velocity. So this is going to be s prime, negative 32t, plus 48. And if I plug t equal to 2 into that, negative 64 plus 48 is negative 16, and that would be in feet per second. The only difference between velocity and speed is that velocity is always going to indicate direction, while speed is not. So the fact that velocity is negative here tells us what we're coming downward. Speed, though, would just be the absolute value of the velocity. And of course, the absolute value of negative 16 gives us positive 16 feet per second. So this doesn't tell us whether we're going up or down, it just tells us how fast. Well, velocity is directed. Positive, of course, would be up, and negative would be down. Finally, the acceleration. Acceleration is the second derivative of your position function. We have our first derivative right here. So taking the derivative again would give me negative 32. And with our units, that would be feet per second squared. All right, when we get to our vector-valued functions in a few minutes, these same relationships are still going to hold true. Even when our height function, or our position function in general, is a vector, our velocity is still going to be the derivative. Speed will be, we'll now interpret this as magnitude, right? And acceleration is still going to be the second derivative. So those relationships won't change. All right, part B. We'd like to find the maximum height of the rock. Well, again, the height function was negative 16t squared plus 48t plus 160. And you know that you can always find the maximum or the minimum of a function using calculus by taking the derivative and setting it equal to 0.
So it looks like t in this case is going to be 1.5. Of course, that's not the maximum height of the rock. That's just the time that it takes the rock to reach that maximum height. To get the actual maximum height, I'll have to plug that back in. S of 1.5. And I'll see that in my calculator. And it looks like I'm going to get 160 out of that. Or excuse me, no, 196 out of that. Finally, the time of flight and the velocity at impact. As far as time of flight, I need to know the time when this rock hits the ground. That's how long it was in flight. And of course, when it hits the ground, I know its height is zero. So if I just set my S equation equal to zero. In general, I don't care how you solve your quadratic equations. Um, this one I think I set up beautifully so it might factor nicely, so I'll go ahead and do that. But you can use a quadratic formula. You can use a calculator app. I don't care how you solve them. In this particular case, if I factor out that negative 16, I can see that that is going to factor as t minus 5. t plus 2, actually I knew where I was going with that. I blew it ahead of time though, didn't I? Um, that should have been a negative when I factored out the negative 16. Sorry, that now makes the factoring correct. So t equals 5, or t equals negative 2. And clearly the negative value is not going to work out. We can't have the rock hitting the ground before we ever threw it. So it looks like the time of flight is going to be 5 seconds. And then the velocity at impact. I just want the velocity at 5 seconds. Velocity was the derivative, so negative 32 times 5 plus 48 is negative 112. And that would be in feet per second. Negative, since it's certainly falling downward at that point, and it's traveling at a speed of 112 feet per second instantaneously, just as it hits that ground. All right, I want you to notice that based on everything we've done here, we have a really nice picture of what's happening to this rock. So if this is the cliff here, this rock went straight up, came straight back down until it hit ground level. When it's initially thrown, we had t equals zero. We know that it reached its maximum height at t equal 1.5. And we also know that that maximum height was 196 feet. Uh, we know it hit the ground at t equal 5. And uh, the other thing I guess we know based on what we actually calculated was that, what was it, at two seconds it was uh, 192 feet up. And since the velocity was negative, it was on the way down, so that would be somewhere right around here. It's 192 feet up when time is two seconds. Right. So just a bunch of information that we know based on the analysis that we did. All right, we'll continue to use these same ideas, but now we're going to start to move toward the two- and three-dimensional systems so we don't have to just go straight up and down, but we can start considering horizontal motion as well. So, 
if I have my rack that's thrown not just straight up, but also horizontally, it may still be thrown from some height, so it might start here somewhere. It's going to go up and come down, but while it does, it also moves in the horizontal direction before it lands. Okay. Notice that now if I still want to keep track of time, I have two additional variables to keep track of. Not just a vertical height, but both a horizontal progress, x, as well as a vertical height, y. So in order to describe this, I now need a vector value function. This path is going to be described by some vector value function r of t, so that when I plug in t, I can calculate not just one, but both the x and the y values. Come up with the exact location of my object after t seconds. If in addition to the vertical and horizontal components, you imagine perhaps that there's like a side-to-side -side wind blowing, I now need to allow for that side-to-side -side motion, meaning I'm going to now need a third component. So typically in this case, we've got our x and y and z, We'll imagine once again our rack, or whatever the object is, starting at some height here. Notice z is now my vertical component. And instead of just going out horizontally over the y-axis, it can get blown forward or backward. And it may land out here somewhere in the xy plane. So now if I describe this, with a vector valued function, it would have to have an x, a y, and a z component, or in other words, be a three dimensional vector valued function. So we'll be looking at examples of both two and three dimensional ones. We'll start with the two. And in order to do this, we're going to start by trying to develop some generalities. We're going to see if we can develop some general vector valued functions that we can go to and use so that we don't have to start from scratch every single time. Okay. So, few definitions here. In this section, we are going to, to interpret our function r of t as the position function for an object in motion. So r of t tells me the x and y and possibly z components, the location of my object, at any given time t0, the location of the object is pointed out by the tip of that vector then. The graph of r of t is the actual path, what we call the trajectory of the object. And again, horizontal and vertical motion we could do in two dimensions. If there's also sideways motion, then we need three. Our same relationships are going to hold from what we did in that old Calc 1 example. If r is my position, then the velocity is going to be the derivative of that. So velocity will also be a vector, and oops, it's going to be the derivative of r. Speed is just the size or magnitude of velocity. So speed is the magnitude of the velocity vector, or in other words, the magnitude of our prime. And acceleration is the second derivative of the position. It will also be a vector. So it's our double prime of t. Okay. Again, those should be pretty familiar relationships other than interpreting this is a magnitude rather than an absolute value. So on our next page, we're going to go ahead and we're going to start from scratch. We're going to say, let's imagine that we have a projectile given both horizontal and vertical velocity. So the typical way that you might throw a ball. The object, therefore, is going to move in two dimensions. We'll assume that our object is thrown from an initial position 
that we'll call x0, y0, and is given an initial velocity when we throw it. We're going to call that u0, v0. Once the object is released, the only force acting on it is the force of gravity. If there's another force acting, we usually need three dimensions. We're going to stick with two for right now. Just that far, let me draw a picture that says or shows what that says. So we are going to start from an initial position x naught y naught. Now typically we start at t equals zero, so usually you'll find that we'll start on the y-axis somewhere, although it doesn't have to be. But I'm going to show that as my initial position x naught y naught. All right, it's thrown both vertically and horizontally, so it's going to go up and out, and eventually it's going to come back down and land on the ground. The initial velocity is the vector u naught v naught, and remember, the velocity is the derivative, and derivative vectors are always tangent to our curves. So when I draw my initial velocity vector, I'm going to come here at the starting point, and I'm just going to draw a vector tangent to the curve there. That's my initial velocity vector, u naught v naught. This curve then is my trajectory, r of t. What I'd like to do is I would like to say, beginning only with the idea that we have gravitational acceleration, which we'll call g, we're going to find the vector-valued equation that describes the position of the object at any time t. We should end up with a fairly familiar-looking equation if you've taken physics, but rather than having to give us the equation, we'll find it using calculus. All right. So again, only force acting is the force of gravity, meaning that I know that the acceleration vector, all gravity is pulling straight downward. So my g vector is going to go straight down, zero in the x component, and it's always negative, so minus g in the y component. The actual value of g depends on the system that we're working in. If we're in the metric system, typically we use g as 9.8 meters per second squared. And if we're using American units, then we'll usually use 32 feet per second squared. Right? Just constant acceleration of gravity values. I'm going to refer to it as the generic G here so we can change these up depending on what the units are in any problem that we work. All right, well, let's see. If that's acceleration, I can go to velocity simply by integrating the acceleration vector, right? The derivative of velocity is acceleration, so we have to integrate acceleration to get velocity. So that's going to be the integral of zero minus g dt. Integral of zero is still zero. And the integral of the constant, negative g, would be negative g times our variable of integration, t. Plus c, the constant of integration. Okay. All right. Now we should be able to solve for that c because we actually know what happens. At time zero, at the beginning, our initial velocity vector is u naught v naught. So if I plug that in, right, v is u naught v naught. v 
equals zero times plugging in t equals zero here is going to give me zero plus c. I can see that c just is equal to u naught v naught. So if I just put that in, then I now have a velocity vector. Let me start over here, which is zero plus u naught, or u naught in the x component, and negative gt plus v naught in the y component. All right, we're halfway there. We've got the velocity. I could now integrate the velocity vector to get the position function r. So if I integrate my velocity function, let's see, u naught's just a constant. So integrating a constant, I get the constant times t. Here I'll get negative g, and then the integral of t would be 1 half t squared plus the integral of the constant v naught gives me v naught times t. And again, I'll have a constant of integration. But what do I know? I know that the position at time zero is x naught y naught. So if I plug that information in here, r is x naught y naught. Plugging in t equals 0 is going to make this whole first term 0. 0 here and 0 here, so the second term is 0 as well, plus c. And you can see that x naught y naught is just equal to c. So when I put all this together, I can get a really nice equation for the position function r, and I'm actually going to write it down here. So when I have an initial position x naught y naught and an initial velocity u naught v naught, the trajectory equation is going to be r of t, which is u naught t plus x naught. comma, negative one-half gt squared plus v naught t plus y naught. So we can now that we've, we've kind of found this using vector calculus, we can use this equation anytime we've got a projectile motion problem in two dimensions, specifically as long as there are no other forces acting other than gravity once the object leaves your hand, so to speak. All right, we'll come back in the next video and do a few examples.